I'm starting another astrobiography. This one is about Dave Peltzer. And he wrote a book about his childhood. It's called A Child Called It. So let me just start off by reading the back of this book to provide a synopsis. A Child Called It. A Child Called It is the unforgettable account of one of the most severe child abuse cases in California history. It is the story of Dave Peltzer, who was brutally beaten and starved by his emotionally unstable alcoholic mother, a mother who played torturous, unpredictable games, games that left him nearly dead. He had to learn how to play his mother's games in order to survive because she no longer considered him a son, but a slave and no longer a boy, but an it. Dave's bed was an old army cot in the basement and his clothes were torn and raunchy. When his mother allowed him the luxury of food, it was nothing more than spoiled scraps that even the dogs refused to eat. The outside world knew nothing of this living nightmare. He had nothing and no one to turn to, but his dreams kept him alive. Dreams of someone taking care of him, loving him and calling him their son. Through each struggle, you'll find yourself enduring his pain, comforting his loneliness and fighting for his will to survive. This compelling story will awaken you to the truth about child abuse and the ability we all have to make a difference. Dave Peltzer is recognized as one of the nation's most effective and respective communicators addressing corporate groups, conventions, and human service professionals. Dave's unique accomplishments have garnered personal commendations from former presidents Ronald Reagan and George Bush. In 1993, Dave was honored as one of the 10 outstanding young Americans and in 1994 was the only American to be honored as one of the outstanding young persons of the world. Dave was also selected as a torchbearer for the 1996 Olympic torch relay. Dave has dedicated his life to helping others help themselves. Here's a brief paragraph under Arthur, author's notes. Some of the names in this book have been changed in order to maintain the dignity and privacy of others. This book, the first part of the trilogy, depicts language that was developed from a child's viewpoint. The tone and vocabulary reflect the age and wisdom of the child at that particular time. This book is based on the child's life from ages four to 12. The second part of the trilogy, The Lost Boy, is based on his life from ages 12 to 18. Chapter One, The Rescue. March 5th, 1973, Dally City, California. I'm late. I've got to finish the dishes on time. Otherwise, no breakfast. And since I didn't have dinner last night, I have to make sure I get something to eat. Mother's running around yelling at my brothers. I can hear her stomping down the hallway towards the kitchen. I dip my hands back into the scalding rinse water. It's too late. She catches me with my hands out of the water. Smack! Mother hits me in the face and I topple to the floor. I know better than to stand there and take the hit. I learned the hard way that she takes that as an act of defiance, which means more hits and worst of all, no food. I regain my posture and dodge her looks as she screams into my ears. I act timid, nodding to her threats. Please, I say to myself, just let me eat. Hit me again, but I have to have food. Another blow pushes my head against the tile countertop. I let the tears of mop defeat stream down my face as she storms out of the kitchen, seemingly satisfied with herself. After I count her steps, making sure she's gone, I breathe a sigh of relief. The act worked. Mother can beat me all she wants, but I haven't let her take away my will to survive somehow. I finished the dishes. Then my other chores. For my reward, I received breakfast, leftovers from one of my brother's cereal bowls. Today it's Lucky Charms. There are only a few bits of cereal left in a half bowl of milk, but as quickly as I can, I swallow it before mother changes her mind. She has done that before. Mother enjoys using food as her weapon. She knows better than to throw leftovers in the garbage can. She knows I'll dig it out later. 
Mother knows most of my tricks. Minutes later, I'm in the old family station wagon. Because I'm so late with my chores, I have to be driven to school. Usually I run to school, arriving just as class begins with no time to steal any food from other kids' lunch boxes. Mother drops my oldest brother off, but keeps me for a lecture about her plans for me tomorrow. She is going to take me to my brother's house, to her brother's house. She says, Uncle Dan will take care of me. She makes it a threat. I give her a frightened look as if I am truly afraid, but I know that even though my uncle is a hard-nosed man, he surely won't treat me like mother does. Before the station wagon comes to a complete stop, I dash out of the car. Mother yells for me to return. I have forgotten my crumpled lunch bag, which has always had the same menu for the last three years, two peanut butter sandwiches and a few carrot sticks. Before I bolt out of the car again, she tell, she says, tell him, tell him you ran into the door. Then in a voice she rarely uses with me, she states, have a nice day. I look into her swollen red eyes. She still has a hangover from last night's stupor. Her once beautiful shiny hair is now frazzled clumps. As usual, she wears no makeup. She is overweight and she knows it. In all, this has become mother's typical look. Because I am so late, I have to report to the administrative office. The gray haired secretary greets me with a smile. Moments later, the school nurse comes out and leads me into her office where we go through the normal routine. First, she examines my face and arms. What's that above your eye, she asks. I nod sheepishly. Oh, I ran into the hall door by accident. Again, she smiles and takes a clipboard from the top of a cabinet. She flips through a page or two, then bends down to show me. Here, she points to the paper. You said that last Monday, remember? I quickly changed my story. I was playing baseball and I got hit by the bat. It was an accident. Accident. I am always supposed to say that, but the nurse knows better. She scolds me, so I'll tell the truth. I always break down in the end and confess, even though I feel I should protect my mother. The nurse tells me that I'll be fine and asks me to take off my clothes. We have been doing this since last year, so I immediately obey. My long sleeve shirt has more holes than Swiss cheese. It's the same shirt I've worn for about two years. Mother has me wear it every day as her way to humiliate me. My pants are just as bad and my shoes have holes in the toes. I can wiggle my big toe out of one of them. While I stand clothed only in my underwear, the nurse records my various marks and bruises on the clipboard. She counts the slash-like marks on my face, looking for any she might have missed in the past. She is very thorough. Next, the nurse opens my mouth to look at my teeth that are chipped from having been slammed against the kitchen tile countertop. She jots a few more notes on the paper. As she continues to look me over, she stops at the old scar on my stomach. And that, she says as she takes a deep swallow, is where she stabbed you? Yes, ma'am, I reply. Oh no, I tell myself, I've done something wrong again. The nurse must have seen the concern in my eyes. She puts the clipboard down and hugs me. God, I tell myself, she is so warm. I don't want to let go. I want to stay in her arms forever. I hold my eyes tightly shut. And for a few moments, nothing else exists. She pats my head. I flinch from the swollen bruise mother gave me this morning. The nurse then breaks the embrace and leaves the room. I rush to put my clothes back on. She doesn't know it, but I do everything as fast as possible. The nurse returns in a few minutes with Mr. Hansen, the principal, and two of my teachers, Miss Woods and Mr. Ziegler. Mr. Hansen knows me very well. I've been in his office more than any other kid in school. He looks at the paper as the nurse reports her findings. He lifts my chin. I'm afraid to look into his eyes, which is mostly a habit from trying to deal with my mother, but it's also because I don't want to tell him anything. Once about a year ago, he called my mother to ask about my bruises. At that time, he had no idea what was really going on. He just knew I was a troubled kid who was stealing food. When I came to school the next day, he saw the results of my mother's beatings. He never called her again. Mr. Hansen barked, he's had enough of this. I almost leap out of my skin with fear. He's going to call my mother again, my brain screams. I break down and cry. My body shakes like jello 
and I mumble like a baby, begging Mr. Hansen not to phone mother. Please, I whine, not today. Do you understand? It's Friday. Mr. Hansen assures me he's not going to call mother and sends me off to class. Since it's too late for a homeroom class, I sprint directly to Mrs. Woodworth's English class. Today's a spelling test on all the states and their capitals. I'm not prepared. Usually I'm a very good student, but for the past few months, I gave up on everything in my life, including escaping my misery through my schoolwork. Upon entering the room, all the students plug their noses and hiss at me. The substitute teacher, a younger woman, waves her hands in front of her face. She's not used to the smell. At arm's length, she hands my test to me. But before I can take my seat in the back of the class by an open window, I'm summoned back to the principal's office. The entire room lets out a howl at me, the reject of the fifth grade. I run to the administration office and I'm there in a flash. My throat is raw and still burns from yesterday's game. Mother played against me. The secretary leads me into the teacher's lounge. After she opens the door, it takes a moment for my eyes to adjust. In front of me, sitting around a table, are my homeroom teacher, Mr. Ziegler, my math teacher, Ms. Moss, the school nurse, Mr. Hansen, and a police officer. My feet become frozen. I don't know whether to run away or wait for the roof to cave in. Mr. Hansen waves me in as the secretary closes the door behind me. I take, I take a seat at the head of the table, explaining I didn't steal anything today. Smiles break everyone's depressed frowns. I have no idea that they are about to risk their jobs to save me. The police officer explains why Mr. Hansen called him. I can feel myself shrink into the chair. The officer asks that I tell him about mother. I shake my head no. Too many people already know the secret and I know she'll find out. A soft voice calms me. I think it's Miss Moss. She tells me it's all right. I take a deep breath, wring my hands and reluctantly tell them about mother and me. Then the nurse has me stand up and show the policeman the scar on my chest. Without hesitation, I will tell them it was an accident, which it was. Mother never meant to stab me. I cry as I spill my guts, telling them mother punishes me because I am bad. I wish they would leave me alone. I feel so slimy inside. I know after all these years, there is nothing anyone can do. A few minutes later, I am excused to sit in the outer office. As I close the door, all the adults look at me and shake their heads in an approving way. I fidget in my chair, watching the secretary type papers. It seems forever before Mr. Hansen calls me back into the room. Ms. Woods and Mr. Ziegler leave the lounge. They seem happy, but at the same time worried. Ms. Woods kneels down and wraps me in her arms. I don't think I will ever forget the smell of the perfume in her hair. She lets go, turning away so I won't ever see her cry. Now I am really worried. Mr. Hansen gives me a lunch tray from the cafeteria. My God, is it lunchtime already? I ask myself. I gobble down the food so fast I can hardly taste it. I finish the tray in record time. Soon the principal returns with a box of cookies, warning me not to eat so fast. I have no idea what's going on. One of my guesses is that my father, who is separated from my mother, has come to get me. But I know it's a fantasy. The policeman asks for my address and telephone number. That's it, I tell myself. It's back to hell. I'm going to get it from her again. The officer writes down more notes as Mr. Hansen and the school nurse look on. Soon, he closes his notepad and tells Mr. Hansen that he has enough information. I look up at the principal. His face is covered with sweat. I can feel my stomach start to coil. I want to go to the bathroom and throw up. Mr. Hansen opens the door and I can see all the teachers on their lunch break staring at me. I'm so ashamed. They know, I tell myself. They know the truth about my mother, the real truth. It is so important for them to know that I'm not a bad boy. I want so much to be liked, to be loved. I turn down the hall. Mr. Ziegler is holding Miss Woods. She is crying. I can hear her sniffle. She gives me another hug and quickly turns away. Mr. Ziegler shakes my hand. Be a good boy, he says. Yes, sir, I'll try, is all I can say. The school nurse stands in silence beside Mr. Hansen. They all tell me goodbye. Now I know I am going to jail. Good, I tell myself. 
At least she won't be able to beat me if I'm in jail. The police officer and I walk outside past the cafeteria. I can see some of the kids from my class playing dodgeball. A few of them stop playing. They yell, David's busted, David's busted. The police touches my shoulder, telling me everything is okay. As he drives me up the street, away from Thomas Edison Elementary School, I see some kids who seem to be phased by my departure. Before I left, Mr. Ziegler told me he would tell the other kids the truth, the real truth. I would give anything to have been there in class when they found out I'm not so bad. In a few minutes, we arrive at the Daly City Police Station. I sort of expect mother to be there. I don't want to get out of the car. The officer opens the door and gently takes me by the elbow into a big office. No other person is in the room. The policeman sits in a chair in the corner where he types several sheets of paper. I watch the officer closely as I slowly eat my cookies. I savor them as long as I can. I don't know when I will be eating again. It's past 1 p.m. when the policeman finishes his paperwork. He asks for my telephone number again. Why, I whine. I have to call her, David, he says gently. No, I command. Send me back to school. Don't you get it? She mustn't find out I told. He calms me down with another cookie as he slowly dials 7562460. I watch the black dial turn as I get up and walk towards him, straining my whole body while trying to hear the phone ringing on the other end. Mother answers. Her voice scares me. The policeman waves me away and takes a deep breath before saying, Mrs. Pelzer, this is Officer Smith from the Daly City Police Department. Your son David will not be coming home today. He will be in the custody of the San Mateo Juvenile Department. If you have any questions, you can call them. He hangs up the phone and smiles. Now that wasn't so hard, was it? He asked me. But the look on his face tells me he is assuring himself more than he is me. A few miles later, we are on Highway 280, headed towards the outskirts of Daly City. I look to my right and see a sign that reads, the most beautiful highway in the world. The officer smiles with relief as we leave the city limits. David Pelzer, he says, you're free. What, I ask, clutching my only source of food. I don't understand. Aren't you taking me to some kind of jail? Again, he smiles and gently squeezes my shoulder. No, David, you have nothing to worry about. Honest, your mother is never going to hurt you again. I lean back against the seat. A reflection from the sun hits my eyes. I turn away from the rays. A single tear runs down my cheek. I'm free. That's the end of chapter one. I will be reading chapter two very soon, so stay tuned for that. Okay, let's try this again. So I don't know where my head was at yesterday, but I know what it was. I was rushing around trying to get this video out and I always know I should not rush around and do things. So there was a, a discrepancy with his date of birth. And I just want to thank Meet Merp, one of my subscribers for catching it. Because when I went back to the comment section, he was like, isn't he born on the 29th instead of the 31st? And I was like, oh, shit, you're right. Because the whole purpose of doing this astral biography was to provide an example of how challenging that 29 could be. So when I came across Dave Peltzer's story, I was like, and I heard about this book years ago, but I never read it. And um, I Googled his birthday. I saw, oh, wow, he's a 29. Makes a lot of sense. So I ordered the book off of Amazon. And it took a few days to arrive. And then when it did arrive, I was so anxious to get to the whole astral biography and get it started that I pulled the chart, not double checking the birthday. For some reason, the whole 29 totally escaped my awareness. Again, I, I'm charging into the Mars retrograde game and my Mars is in Gemini retrograde. So for some reason, I put the 31st and then I just went with it and started interpreting the chart. But then I do remember thinking like, this chart doesn't seem as bad as it should be considering his story. So it makes so much sense that I had the birth date wrong. I had the year right, but 
I was a few days off. So I apologize. So I had to take the video down. I was like, what? I, I'm going to have to redo this. And I was so disgusted with myself that I was like, I can't even deal with it the rest of the day. So I was like, let me just put it off till tomorrow. So with that being said, let's get into his chart. So Dave Peltzer, born December 29, 1960. That 29 is a very challenging number to be born on. Uh, it produces all manners of conflict in one's personal life, especially conflict involving the mother. And that was his main demon, his mother. Also conflict involving home, family, conflict involving food. And he was deprived of food as a young boy. Now, he has a Capricorn stellium consisting of Mercury, the Sun, Jupiter, and Saturn. And that can produce a hard knock life, especially during the early part of one's life. And also, he has Mercury, Sun, and Jupiter opposing that Mars in Cancer. And that's his mother going up against him, uh, mistreating him. Mars in Cancer can deal with a mother who is abusive, violent abuse at the hands of a mother, also conflicts within the home. Also, Mars and Cancer can manifest as hot water. So in chapter one, he did mention that he had to put his hands in scalding rinse water. And that is represented by his Mercury opposing Mars and Cancer with Mercury ruling the hands, Capricorn dealing with the skin. Also, he said that she slammed his head on a tile counter, and that resulted in some of his teeth being chipped, and Capricorn rules the teeth, so that opposition is dealing with that as well. Also, the opposition is representing the starvation, with Capricorn ruling starvation, and that Mars in Cancer is representing his mother threatening to withhold food from him, or the time she actually did withhold food, and it's also representing the fear and the loneliness that ensued as a result of the way he was being treated. Also, uh, Mercury and Capricorn in particular is representing the school administrators and the opposition with Mars is representing them stepping in so that he would no longer be abused by his mother. Also is showing lacking his mother's love as well. Now, his moon is in Gemini, or it could be in Gemini. If he was born in the early hours of uh, the 29th, it would be in Taurus, but I believe it's in Gemini for various reasons. Number one, the school theme. So Gemini rules schools. And the school nurse in, partic in particular, because the moon rules nurses and Gemini rules schools. And also the fact that the mom was being called. And that's very moon in Gemini. And also his autobiography, the book that I'm reading. So the moon is dealing with your background, your personal life, your personal history, your story. And with Gemini, that deals with writing, it deals with books. Now, this chart makes so much more sense than the other chart because with this chart, his moon is squaring the nodes as well as Pluto. And that moon square Pluto in particular can deal with an abusive mom but it also deals with him being smelly and dirty, and that was due to her. Also, the moon squaring that Pisces South Node that's dealing with neglect, humiliation, and enslavement at the hands of his mother. His Venus is at the 22nd degree of Aquarius, and remember I always say that 22nd degree is about control or be controlled, and it's conjoined to Chiron, and that can deal with strange eating habits or having to eat abnormally, like there's something abnormal in terms of the way he's eating or what he's eating. And he did mention that he had to, you know, eat his brother's scraps or sometimes he would take food out the trash, um, take some of the food out of the kids' lunches at school. Also, that's pointing to the wounds that were visible on him and that shocked people and that were unsettling. But also with the Venus influence, it's representing the wounds that pr provided evidence against his mother. And that's basically dealing with that sesqui square involving Mars and Cancer. And as well as that sesqui square is also dealing with him being separated from his mother, being taken out of the home. But I'm also seeing Venus sesqui square Mars. Here it is right here. 
Let me get my drawing tool. I'm also seeing that Venus Sesame Square Mars as objects being thrown at him. Because Aquarius deals with projectiles, things that are flying through the air. And Venus is representing objects. I wouldn't be surprised if this conjunction was in his first house because Aquarius is a sign of dehumanization, depersonalization, and his mother referred to him as it. And that is represented by that sesqui square involving Mars, Venus, sesqui square, Mars. So he had Venus opposition, Uranus, and this is representing separations. It's also representing him being ostracized and alienated, being bullied. Now, the underlying reason why he had to go through this level of suffering was due to that Pisces self note. It's at the ninth degree, and the ninth degree deals with one's identity. Again, he was referred to as it. And the ninth degree of Pisces can deal with negation of the self or where your individual self does not matter. Ninth degree also deals with violence, abuse, anger, aggression. And Pisces is one of the uh, worst signs for the South Node, if you ask me. It can produce sorrow, loss, sacrifice, neglect, enslavement, isolation, being an outcast, victimization, being confined or caged or imprisoned. It can produce fear, paranoia, and also mental health disorders. Also, the addiction, alcoholism theme is coming into play with that Pisces self node dealing with his mother. So the moon square in that Pisces self node makes a lot of sense. And then he has Pluto and the north node opposing that Pisces self node. And what that's basically representing is that police officer that rescued him with Virgo representing the police. Also, it's representing him being abused on the regular, being treated like an animal or like trash, poor hygiene, nervous breakdowns, not doing chores, results in abuse. Also malnourishment due to neglect. So as I get deeper into his book, of course, I'm going to be getting deeper into his chart. So y'all let me know what you think in the comments section. Um, just a terrible, terrible uh, childhood this boy had. And I almost started tearing up reading that first chapter alone. So this is going to be an emotional story for me. And like I said, um, I already saw in the first video, some people were um, saying that they had read the book when they were younger. So like I said, for some, this could be a refresher. And where an astrological perspective is given. For those that are new to this book, it could be an eye-opener in terms of what could produce a life like that when we look at the chart. All right, stay tuned for more chapters. Peace.